am I well actually? I think that's a really good question and one that I think we should reflect on a lot more. Um, I do think I'm well, but for me, being well um, has a totally different definition to what I did before and a very different definition to, I guess, what you would consider well, mm. etc. from my own baseline. So yeah, I would say I'm better than I've been in a long time. That's good to know. Thank you. And um, you mentioned there that you know you have a, like a different baseline now. What have you always been well, or talk me talk me through a little bit about your journey to wellness, if you like? I think I used to think of um, feeling well in terms of looking well previously mm. a lot of the time. So I would associate it with the size of my body or how much I was taking care of myself sort of aesthetically. Whereas now it's a lot more about how I speak to myself, my general anxiety levels. It's a lot more to do with mental and emotional mm. health, I'd say. That's the distinction. And can you talk a bit more about the sort of how you speak to yourself piece of that? Yeah, I, I discovered um, working in addiction and learning more about uh, self-talk and behavioural change and all sorts of self-help tools in general, that I was pretty harsh in the way that I spoke to myself mm -hmm. and that it was not helping um, in any way whatsoever. Um, and so I started to examine that and use it in to my advantage. And now I use it a lot to sort of try to give myself the same advice and apply it to self-care principles that I would recommend to another person. Mm -hmm. And that was before I worked in this industry. It was a lot more about like, what would I recommend to my friend or my mum? And I used to see a, a real gap, not just in terms of how compassionate I was in my self-talk and compared to what I would tell them, but also in terms of how um, how good the advice was that I would take. Yeah. So I just tuned into the fact that I am having a conversation with myself. And so I feel well when that conversation feels like it's the same one I'd have with someone else. Mm -hmm. And when you're, and, and when you are, so when in the past you might not have spoken to yourself with, with such kindness, what kind of, if I can ask this, what kind of sort of maybe destructive behaviors did that lead to? For me, it was the spiraling of unhelpful behaviour. So in my case, it was binging, mm -hmm. binge eating, uh, and also extreme dieting, mm -hmm. uh, codependent behaviours, uh, behaviours that were kind of based in fear a lot of the time that I later regretted because the damage that I would do to my body or to my relationships. And so then when I would beat myself up about having done those things in the first place, it just became a cycle of guilt and shame and then continuing to do those things again out of fear. Um, and so when I learned to break that cycle, not by policing myself, but by taking the fear and judgment and shame out of the behaviours that I wasn't proud of and maybe wanted to change, not only did it help me change them a lot more quickly, it just felt better every day. And it was a much more, trans it was a really transferable skill. That's so great, yeah. Because I guess as well, you don't have to be, once you start befriending yourself through self-kindness you don't need to rely so much on another person or food or anything else like that is that that does that sound about right yeah definitely it, it for me it helps me to put a space between wanting to do it wanting to do something and actually doing it mm. that that's what it is and someone said once to me that um, when you're by yourself you're not by yourself you're with yourself yeah. And that really clicked in for me because I was like, huh, if I'm with myself, then I could protect myself a little bit more. I could be a little bit more discerning about the choices I make. I could guide and advise myself accordingly, mm -hmm. as opposed to feel that I was at the mercy of things. And so for me, it helped me kind of s slow everything down and do things on purpose. Yeah, to give yourself more agency, really. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's so great. And could you, I mean, you've, you've mentioned a little bit about... Um, self-kindness as being a really good tool for well-being for your well-being are there any kind of specific sort of um actionable things you could share that you'd maybe that maybe some daily practices for example that that help you to stay in this state of, of being well actually absolutely <laughs> i think for me because so much of my work is concerned with behavioral change and um impulse control as a result there are three questions I, t I tell people to ask themselves on the spot when they suspect that they're about to take an action that they might later regret yes. or that they will look back on the next day in which they haven't engaged in. And one of them, there, there are three. You ask yourself, what will I be glad I, I did when I look back at this tomorrow? What would I advise the person I love most in the whole world to do right now? And if the smartest person I know is watching me, what would I want them to observe me doing? 
And so you kind of take it through that, uh, that checklist and see where you land with the decision. Mm. And those three questions save me a lot of the time because mm. I'm quite a hasty, I can be quite a hasty, urgent yeah. person. And then later on, I kind of go back and almost gaslight myself and think, where was I? How did I think that was yeah. a good idea? Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, it makes me kind of zoom out and remember that, um, you know, my decisions have a knock-on impact on each other and then back on me. Mm -hmm. And sometimes my first idea should really just be a jumping off point for negotiations. It should not be a command that I have to obey. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, it helps me. And I guess you could apply that logic to, well, binge eating, to other kind of addictive tendencies, maybe to, you know, if you're going to have an argument with someone that you'll later regret. Yeah, yeah. I've heard someone describe it as um, giving up what you want now for what you want really. Yes. Which I That's such a good one. I, I have not been fairly impulsive in my life and I definitely think there are times when, yeah, you kind of just almost want to talk, you want to try and get a sense of what tomorrow you or a few hours, in, in a few hours time you, if that makes sense, once. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, what else did I want to ask you? Oh, yeah. That bit out. <laughs> um, or, so, it, like you talk about the what you've talked about sharing is quite simple, really, and it's 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 not very. It's a really nice way of you know it's a, it's about make helping people to find their own agency a little bit because they're they're talking kindly to themselves. I see personally a lot of things kind of flying around the internet that kind of well they proclaim to make you well, but I tend to sense that actually the people sharing these things are not quite as invested in that as they might claim to be. With that said, are there any sort of wellness practices out there that you think might be not that great? <laughs> not that great. Do you know what? Um, it's a difficult one because it depends on who you are and what, what your needs are and how vulnerable you are. There are wellness practices that I enjoy and engage in that I would not endorse. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Because I wouldn't like necessarily <laughs> want people thinking that I'm going there for a reason. Like, like I'm, I'm trying out things now, almost in a hobbyist fashion. And thinking, yeah. well, if I come out feeling better. But if someone was coming into the situation really, uh, you know, where I was five or ten years ago, mm -hmm. then I would be doing them a huge disservice by saying that this is that these kinds of things I try out now would be an alternative to, you know, things like how much talking therapy helped me, etc. And I think that's that's can be a little bit dangerous. Um, one thing I don't like on the self-talk piece is when I see on Instagram people writing things like, if you have a negative thought about yourself, just replace it with a positive one. Mm. And I'm like, oh, you should be on the news. <laughs> You're amazing. You're an amazing wizard. <laughs> um, and I just don't, I feel like if I had heard that and tried it a few years back, I would have been like, not for me. Yeah. When actually the, um, the idea of listening into the way it was speaking to yourself obviously I, I think is fantastic mm. so sometimes I think something good is lost by being too reductive um, or isolating people who have suffered tr real trauma and could actually do with starting to dip a toe in but it just takes them straight out of the game yes when it simplifies it to that degree I guess that's the one of the issues with um things that are shared on social media and you know social media can be great in sharing ideas but also they get very condensed so it can be over, overly simplified I think. Absolutely and I think that sometimes people think well that's not for me then. Yeah. When actually it could contribute to a very diverse toolkit yeah. of lots of things that come together to be for you. So it's a yeah it's a toolkit just if I can ask you what um would you say is in your toolkit now and what's kind of what if, I mean, you don't have to tell me every single thing because it, no, be, it might be a lot of things, but what would be like a toolkit for you? For me, currently, mm -hmm. um, we get the obvious ones out of the way. I exercise. Mm -hmm. I like to exercise, um, which I never thought I'd say before. <laughs> so it didn't, what kind that of, didn't start at all. What kind of exercise? I like hectic exercise. <laughs> it's meditative for me. Like cardio? So I like cardio where people are like, there's loud music and dark rooms and, and, and things like that. And I also like doing, um, at the moment, because I, I can't get to those classes for various reasons, I do like morning, three minutes of squats, three minutes of whatever else, just to kind of show my body that it's gonna matter today. It's just a signal, it isn't really for exercise. That's so um, great, I love that. So it's kind of like a, it's like a self, 
kindness exercise. It's more of a visual. It's it's more of a visual for me in the same way that I, I just think it's important to give ourselves signals that our body matters as frequently as possible. Whether it's that I leave a bottle of, you know, sometimes I'll just put like a slice of cucumber in my water. <laughs> and all of a sudden I'll think, oh, check me out. It'll make me have a nicer glass and it'll make me, I don't know, sit up straight. And I just feel like these things have a domino effect on each other. So if I get up in the morning and I do something that moves my body, I am not concerned with its aerobic or anything like that. Um, I just want to go, right, what opportunity do I have to give my body a, uh, a signal that it, it's on my radar today? Um, when I'm feeling particularly anxious or periods where I felt anxious, breath work has helped me a lot, like mm. um, conscious connected breaths, or I've gone to actual breath work workshops that have been nothing short of transformative. Um, journaling, I write stuff down and I say stuff aloud because yes. when I have lots of conflicting anxious thoughts that feel overwhelming. I say them aloud because then you have to sort of tell a story. You have to be linear. Um, and it helps me, it helps me identify what I have to worry about right now compared to like existential stuff. And then what comes in is all of a sudden like, oh, that horrible thing happened to me 10 years ago. And whereas if I have to actually define what is wrong with me today, what do I think is going to happen? What am I afraid of? That helps me a lot. Um, I used, I, I used to say in interviews that I, which is true, that I used to go to a karaoke booth by myself, but then lockdown happened. And one of my friends, who we know, um, got me a karaoke microphone. Oh. So when I'm working into the night, writing and stuff, I'll punctuate every hour or so with a couple of songs. That is brilliant. It's really nice. But what are your go-to songs? Graceland by Paul Simon. <laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> and at the moment, I've been moving into Elvis a little bit more too. I've okay. been enjoying my Elvis. Do you sing it at his... Tone, or do you it depends, there? really. It depends on the song, but it's definitely <laughs> not for mastery or to entertain anyone. Um, but it's a, you know, it's a kind of meditation or whatever, and it, yeah. it, it, it punctuates the process. And the reason I always kind of bring that up is also because I think a lot of the time we get het up in this is wellness. Mm -hmm. You've got to sit cross legged. You've got to burn sage. And I mean, I do all that stuff too if I want to. But then you can also, you know. It can be treating yourself to a takeout as well. It can be cool. all of that stuff. Cooking. All of it. Stuff, yeah. Um, so yeah, I do stuff like that, journaling, uh, exercise. I love the karaoke thing, and I think you said it, put, you know, it's a sort of meditation in a way. And I think any, you know, people think of meditation and they think it's sitting still and being quiet and having no thoughts at all, but it's not that at all. It's just, it's anything really, I think, that immerse, you're immersed in what you're doing and you're, you're having you're having fun, you're not, you're not kind of maybe recklessly having fun, like you're not kind of getting pissed, or, but you're, you're, you're present, but you're also not trying to achieve a goal, you're just there. So I think, yeah, anything that inspires that feeling is, is meditation. Yeah. I think it's good for people to know that, because if they see, yeah, wellness and mindfulness as this very strict, very one kind of dimensional thing, then, as you said, it's going to put people off doing it. It also becomes sort of two steps forward, five steps back kind of mm -hmm. thing. You have a go and then you have people writing off entire areas of well-being or health or whatever else just because that one experience was too immersive or just too much or just unrealistic to sustain. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I think it can turn people off. Whereas if they think, I think what turns people off a lot of the time is the perfectionism that's assumed mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. Whereas, for example, sometimes I'll say, oh, you know, I'll go to Pilates class and I have like chicken nuggets on the way home. Yeah. Have some fish and chips on the way home Balance. and a lot of people are like what what's the point then and i'm like that's the point otherwise it's not going to stay in my life for long yeah you know if i want to be doing this in a year i've got to see a scenario where it exists with chips yeah it's got to feel like <laughs> do you know what i mean like, otherwise i'm either going to be in this camp or this camp always yeah and that's exhausting it becomes all or nothing because yeah. it becomes in that thing of when you're being good or bad it's like what if you could just combine both yeah, what if nothing's good or bad? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, you just kind of, you know. Yeah, something I really like that you say is when you're talking about sort of, especially for people who binge, how they approach certain foods, is you say, is this helpful or unhelpful rather than good or bad? Yeah, helpful or unhelpful based on where I'm trying to get to. Yeah. So everyone's helpful and unhelpful will be different too. Yes. For some people, um, helpful for where you're trying to get to will mean to sit down, <laughs> Do what you like, 
and stop worrying about other people and rules and whatever else. And for other people, that will be the opposite of what will be helpful to them right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. So I think I'm just identifying what gets me closer and what moves me further away. And that's not to say to not do the things that move you further away, but just to be conscious of how frequently you want to do them and be more discerning about what deserves to slow you down. Mm-hmm. Um, and for everyone, that's a different thing. So I think it's just important to give yourself the permission to ask. Yes. And I guess that's just something that you could do through journaling as well. Yeah, just literally ask yourself, where do I want to get to? Where do I want to be in three, six months? What current behaviours and beliefs are moving me closer to that? And what current behaviours and beliefs are moving me further away? And where can I tweak accordingly? That's good. Now, and what would you say to someone who maybe kind of knows what they, what behaviours are moving them away from where they want to be, and yet they just can't seem to kick them? I mean, that's quite a big question. No, I think that's, yeah, that's literally my whole job. Um, <laughs> sorry, let me have a think. I should have an answer. Um, it's a big, big question. I think a lot of the time, people do not anticipate that they need plans for the periods when they're going to want to throw in the towel. They think that because they have enough reasons to change that that will spur them on the whole way Mm -hmm. whereas that element of mastery that's required and repetition and testing your changes and your new behaviors against different landscapes that that challenge and test you takes longer than you i think we anticipate a lot of the time um and it isn't enough to just want to change it isn't enough to know how to change it's also really important to know what's keeping you the way you are I actually think that's that often gives us a lot more insight and compassion for ourselves as to why we're finding something difficult that someone else might find really easy. Yes. Um, but there are reasons to stay the same way. So I think rather than just focusing only on what do I want to get away from and what do I want to move towards, it's about thinking, why am I, um, why am I staying where I am? Mm-hmm. What do I stand to gain by staying the same way? What am I scared will happen if I change? These are the questions people don't ask because very often the habits we want to change are actually, we've already decided they're bad. And by extension, we're bad for as long as we engage in them. If we consider that we're good and have a range of resources that can help us to inform impulse control, and also that maybe the habits are good to some extent in that they have served a purpose or continue to serve a purpose for us, it helps us to diversify our toolkit and think, okay, what else could serve that purpose? but also to appreciate why we're, why we're finding it difficult and not think that just desire and knowledge of how to change will suffice when it comes to those moments where we want to throw in the towel and um, really regret disrupting the safe, comfortable status quo that we've come to mm, normalise. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for something, just to give an example of that, I've always found, you know, Christmas to be quite a triggering time in terms of eating because it's the excess is there. And, I must admit that every year I say, okay, I'm going to have a plan in place. But because I get caught up in just being around family, and weirdly, even though my family are relatively chaotic, we don't actually argue at Christmas. Oh, nice. nice. I know. I don't know what it is. But, um, yeah, just I think there's a, we, there's a we, strength in numbers. There's, like, a diffusion through all of our family members, I think. You have those characters who keep the peace. Yeah, it just it, there's so much, I mean, you've been to my wedding, you've seen what my family are like, it's a lot. So yeah, I think it just, it almost just, it's too, like, yeah, anyway. Basically, we don't argue. So there's no stress in that respect, but there's a lot of like, eat more of this, drink more of this, da 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 da. And every year I just let myself kind of be like, it'll be fine. And every year I end up, you know, just not feeling great thereafter. Um, because I, yeah, and I think it's, it's almost like an arrogance to think that it's going to be fine when actually, as you say, you need to have that plan in place. I think the plan is good to be, uh, to set intentions, but I think it's also important that if you came away from Christmas and your attitude was, and I'm asking you this, honestly, mm. if, I'm, if I'm wrong, tell me, but if your attitude was, wow, I really enjoyed that. Yeah. I'm glad I did that. I did what I wanted on purpose mm. because things were delicious. Mm. And now I actually really do want to go back to maybe eating more fruits and vegetables. I feel like that lends itself to you making that choice more Mm. than, oh my God, what did I do? I feel awful. I'm going to deprive myself of any kindness until I resolve this situation. That's the thing. I don't, I think that's the bigger issue. Absolutely. People set guidelines. If you want to change the sort of person you are at Christmas, then there's only one way to do it. You only get one chance a year. So (laughs) crack on and create as many guidelines as you like. But I do think the important piece is as soon as you do something that you've come to learn is bad, 
think about it and whether you actually think it is or whether you tell someone else it is or whether it's something you were just told and actually has become wildly unhelpful in your pursuit of eating more healthily or whatever it might be. Mm. It's actually counterproductive a lot of the time because the guilt and shame is often what people like us eat on. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that's, I think that's the more important bit is to come away from Christmas and think. How are you talking to yourself after that? Yeah. 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 And that's me. And then, um, is there is there something? Is there like a practice or a same or even like a product you use? I'm not asking you to plug anything. I wish um, someone would. <laughs> I mean, plug away. What is it? What's it? You want to plug? Chanel, Poundland. I'll take anything. <laughs> What's the thing? I like to place things from both of those places. Chanel and Poundland. Poundland. That's great. Anywhere on the spectrum, you want to help me out? It's good. Yeah. Are you listening? <laughs> Chanel and Pound Lab. Um, um, what, is there something that you wish um, more people knew? Like, is there something, a practice or a thing that you wish more people knew about that's geared towards well-being? And it doesn't have to be obvious. Great question. Yes, I wish people knew that if you write, if you get into the habit of writing things you've done that are difficult or that you're proud of yourself for or that you've overcome, then when you're trying to do something difficult or undesirable, if you glance at it, it will completely change your attitude to the challenge ahead of you. And it is as simple as writing it on your phone and it can take five minutes and it can completely change your day. Whether it's, if I'm I'm trying, I hate Excel, right? Hate it, (laughs) truly, truly hate it. My friend Sam says that I treat Excel like a piece of paper with lines drawn. drawn Yeah, that's kind of my vibe as well. Hate it. And so if I know I have to do tax or whatever, I'm just like, ah. And then I look at this list of stuff that I've done is because there's considerably harder. And it does make me think, well, yeah, this is hard, but obviously I do hard things and I'll just, let's just get this done. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I wish more people knew that it's ambitious to think that you're going to bring to the forefront of your mind when you want to bail out on a difficult thing or an undesirable task or make a decision you'll be glad you make tomorrow as opposed to, you know, the one you want to make today is that doubting your capacity can be the beginning of the end. And if you can just refresh your knowledge of your own capacity factually too. This is not me walking around being like, I am a beautiful flower and I deserve to be watered by whatever. You are. Thank you. And I do. (laughs) Um, I believe so. But in that moment, that's not going to cut it for the Excel spreadsheet, right? It's like real life stuff. So I'm just basically looking at this going, okay, this is a list of stuff that I've got through lockdown on my own. And all of a sudden you're like, of course I can do a spreadsheet. Right? And so I I wish people knew that because they often ask me for like procrastination tools and they've downloaded all these apps and like, read all these books about procrastination it's like I cannot tell you how many people read loads of books about procrastination before they do anything yeah. obviously yeah um, <laughs> and and it's like no literally the point is that you are doubting your capacity in that moment if you are thinking I can't do this look at a bunch of stuff you've done um it's really easy and I wish more people knew that and kids too I think it helps kids a lot that's so good that's great advice I actually will start implementing that myself no I didn't is there anything on your, what would be on your list? Or you said actually getting getting through lockdown. I am really impressed with how I deal with anxiety these days. Mm. Um, I'm really impressed by the fact that it's Sunday. I think I have tonsillitis. I had a really bad night's sleep. And I've been able to sit here and not care about how I look, not care about whatever. I just want to get across information. Like This for me would have been very exposing, very difficult. Mm. I would have come away regretting it and second guessing myself and wondering if I said one word that would have pissed someone off or whatever but um I don't have that anymore that's brilliant so for me that's a huge that it's huge I would have never thought that that would happen and it seems to have happened you know there are components there are efforts that I've made but finally it seems to be happening on its own without me doing too much don't get me wrong I still do the stuff yeah but the current is not as strong and I'm really proud of myself for persevering because it's persevering because it has been years of the journaling, years of the sitting in the discomfort for anxiety specifically. Um, and I, it seems to be going pretty well. And the, the thing with anxiety is you don't really know it's gone until it comes back. So let's see. <laughs> no, I mean, that's great. And it, I think it's really good that you emphasize that it's years because I, another thing again, maybe from social media and stuff, things, there's a lot of things that people might see the end result of something and think, oh, that's a quick fix, I'll feel better in two weeks. When actually, of course, you'll start to feel better when you implement these things straight away, I'm sure, in, in time. But 
yeah, the, the real when it becomes well, you as someone who deals in behavioural change, when it becomes that second nature, oh, it takes a while for it's your lovely. body to, yeah, but it must be so, it's so worth it, right? It's easier to measure with behaviour too, yeah. whereas when it comes to mental health stuff, and you also don't want to put the onus on yourself to be, you know, I, I, am, I there's only so much I can do if my brain is not on side, you know, at certain mm-hmm. times, whether it's chemically or because of what's going on or both or, you know, all those mm-hmm. things. Um, I think it's important to remember that we all have a different baseline too. Absolutely. So like no one knows the extent of the chatter in my head. It might still be more than that of the average, you know, the general population. And I I often tell people when they buy my books, um, don't be like me because you might buy my book and benefit from it, but your baseline is totally different. You might use it to run a marathon. Mm. You might use it because you've never had anxiety before and you just had a teeny bit of anxiety and now it, it, it helps you and I might have it for the rest of my life and use and use this stuff for that. So I think the important thing is to measure from your own honest baseline as well. Mm. And for me, not feeling anx- as anxious as I would have done about things like this Yes. and feeling confident in, the, in that what I'm sh- sharing is of value with minimal pushback internally compared to before is... Um, I, yeah, I think that's what I'm most proud of. Brilliant. And that must have really been a good thing to observe when you were writing. And I guess you, Sheree has written two books, by the way. Yeah. The Last books. Diet and The Kindness Method. Thank you. So, how, well, because by maybe when you were writing The Kindness Method, you kind of had already started to feel that shift. But maybe when you were writing The Last Diet, did you have more of those kind of inner gremlin voices? Or had, had it started to shift already? To be honest with you, both of those things happened before lockdown. Mm. And so lockdown and COVID in general just completely changed me. As I know, it did a lot of people, but I was living by myself. Yes. My books were just starting to do well, and then lockdown happened. Self-employed, yeah. everything was on the up, and I did have a moment of fear that... My fear that my cool life that was just taking off wouldn't come back was more than my fear of messing up within that life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that tipping point happened. And so now I'm just grateful for everything. That's great. Um, and, and so I do, yeah, I think, I think that's the distinct, that's one of the main distinctions too. Mm-hmm. And also because the tools worked under those circumstances. That so was you could literally put it to test. I really <laughs> have never, and, and people were using the kindness method and the last diet throughout lockdown. Um, and that, if ever there was a pressure test, yeah uh, for people to choose to want to do stuff like that and then feedback to me that it was working i mean i do also get the added bonus of all that validation and feedback and confirmation that this stuff works mm-hmm. and so having it work during lockdown for so many people was definitely uh, a badge of quality assurance that yeah. was useful to me and definitely informed my confidence about saying look it's working it's definitely working it's not just me <laughs> it's definitely working and also because when you write a book five years ago about m- people making sustained changes, you do kind of in good conscience have to wait for them to make those changes. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> a little bit of a cooling off period. Yeah, you know, like when you watch those programs and people have these transformations, it's like, yeah, yeah, call me in four years and tell yeah. me what they're up to, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so there was an element of that too, so everything's kind of finally set now. Yeah. And, you, and, you, and you've been able to, from the kind of... the, the the, the, the way your books have helped people, you've been able to expand that into sort of practical courses and workshops and things like that. You do, you do you've done a few workshops, haven't you, for the Kindness Method workshops? Yeah, I do the Guardian Masterclasses for the Kindness Method, and I used Brilliant. to do it at the uh, School of Life. Um, yeah, it's interesting to me, actually, although I would have been the same way, I think we have this interesting thing where we all think that we're the most extreme or that we're the ones who aren't clocking on to the good stuff we should be doing because mm-hmm. a lot of my workshops I feel are just me talking people through the book mm. so initially I used to feel quite guilty and be like <laughs> what else am I going to give them because there's even an audio and then I realized no there is something to be said for someone sitting down with you and saying let's do this together and when you have a question ask me and when it gets tricky share with the group and and so the workshops have been a revelation to me if Mm. if nothing else yeah um and it brings it to life brings it to life yes and i think also it enables me to iterate you know i'm getting all this feedback and people are saying i I used it this way and i used it in this context and this is the profile of this person on the other side of the world and they're feeding back to me 
this is how it works best. So um, I also want to continue to be able to share that back in because obviously you don't go back to the book, to the manuscript and ask the publisher to <laughs> change it constantly. Hey, I'm just uh, adding an edit. <laughs> yeah, plus I'm going through it too. Yeah. So I write all the time. I make, I make notes all the time, observations all the time. I'm like, okay, well, so someone who's at my stage in the recovery process, for example, with binge eating or anxiety or codependency, oh, so this is the new wave that comes in. Mm. You know, it's invariably we're always going to go in chapters. Yeah. And so there'll be people in my position now, like, you know, I spoke to a client the other day who is no longer binge eating, no longer obsessing about food, and now she's like, oh, you know, my North Star is gone. I, I, there's a huge gap where this used to be, and now yeah. I want to work on that. Yeah. So um, I will continue to want to grow in that area and make life easier for myself however I can. And for as long as I can share it simply, because mm. it needs to be simple if I'm going to take it on board. Yeah, um, it really does. Then I will. I think simplicity is just what people need right now. Well, they always, I think it's the most helpful. I think so too. Jargon free. Yeah. And you also run, um, well, you're doing your maiden voyage of the last diet kind of as a, a course at the moment, aren't you? Is that something you'll keep doing for people? Because I can think of a lot of people who would benefit. Yeah, I think um, people are, I think a lot of us got screwed over by diets. Oh, yeah. And um, I don't think we talk enough, or no one's talking, in my opinion, enough. I would like to talk about it if anyone wants to talk to me about it constantly, <laughs> about what diets um, have to answer for, not just with disordered eating, but a lot of people who feel that they're not in bodies that they would like to be in when it comes to weight management and feeling more calm and empowered around their food choices and how they treat their bodies. Um, they have, diets have caused some of these problems for a lot of people and they've been left screwed over. So they didn't get the results they wanted in the first place, but now they also have disordered eating mm -hmm. and it's impacting their mental health. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it is a difficult conversation that I'm proud of myself for being able to have where you reconcile the desire to want to manage your weight with the, uh, the first and foremost, the desire to want to feel empowered and calm around your food choices and make food choices on purpose without feeling at the mercy of your urges yes. brought, on, brought on by diets. Yeah. And so that's what I want to do with the binge eating course and am doing currently. And I've been very pleasantly surprised by the first one because frankly, and I don't want to do a disservice to what I've learned academically and everything else, but it really is um, so hard for people to understand how difficult it is. And when it comes to binge eating, you know, I've noticed that when I was, uh, you know, much, much bigger than I am now, no one ever asked me if I had a difficult relationship with food. Mm. It was always just seen as greed, I guess, oh, or laziness. Yeah. yeah. But no one ever thought, like, maybe she's depending on food, maybe she's controlling, maybe yeah. she's... Whereas I've got friends who were, uh, you know, very... I guess the world would see them as being very underweight. And the assumption was, maybe this person's not okay. Mm. And again, I'm not trying to pit eating disorders against each other. They're all awful. But I do feel that the self, it's, be, it's, not, it's been nice to be the person who comes forward and says, look, I can have this conversation. I believe at this stage, with the, the, the knowledge that I have, I can have this conversation safely yes. and compassionately and hold those two often seemingly conflicting things together. Mm. Because actually, I think the pursuit of this one has caused this one, in fact. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I've been duty, that's my... I mean, I could get on a soapbox about binge eating and dieting. I really get <laughs> how yeah. misunderstood it is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's what the binge eating course is for. Out of interest, when did, oh, you might not know this, but I feel like the term binge eating disorder only came into the, what's that big book called? With all DSM. The DSM, only not that long ago, right? Compared oh, to the it. other eating disorders. I don't know the answer to that. I'll find out. Yeah. Which but I believe, yeah, because I believe it was like a lot more recent. That than, wouldn't surprise yeah. me. That wouldn't surprise me at all. And yet so many people do it. Yeah, and I think there'll be a real surge of it um, over lockdown. And I think the disassociation of uh, post-lockdown, I think there's, we really need to now more than ever disassociate how you feel about how you look from how you feel about your relationship with food. Yeah. Um, because I speak to a number of people who do not like their relationship with food and it's got absolutely nothing to do with how they look. Mm -hmm. And yet we just assume um, that they're related. Of course. And for some people they are because they don't like the byproduct and whatever, that's, mm -hmm. that's their prerogative. I was one of those people. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I don't speak to anyone who would choose the way that 
the people who come to me, regardless of the impact it had on their, it has or doesn't have on their bodies, would choose to change the way they eat because of the impact it has on their minds. Mm. Um, so those are the people that I. Yeah, I mean it is. Yeah, it is. Whether or not you, it has. It is linked to your body image. It does just take up a lot of uh, rental in your head, doesn't it? Thinking Absolutely. about food and it, in where other things could could reside. But yeah, well. I think you're doing amazing work and I just wish everybody could well in fact everyone can buy your books <laughs> and sign up to your courses um but yeah you've it's been a real pleasure to speak to you Sheru thank you thank, thank, thank you for coming on well actually thank you for having me I think this is a really um important conversation to have that I think uh, a lot of people could do with the the jargon busting and the myth busting that you're that you're doing here. So thank you. Oh.